And so this is the last little bit of the health uh, effects slides. We're talking about uh, how we deal with radioactivity, you know, the damage to our bodies and so on, and then two different theories of toxicology. And so the threshold theory of toxicology is, is uh, that doses below this threshold can be handled by the body. Okay? And we're talking about acute doses. So you get, you get a blast of a dose. Uh, you've heard me say all semester that the toxin is the dose. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, that you have low doses of something that may still cause damage to the body, but the body has repair mechanisms that can keep up. Um, and so these doses are not additive. So what does that mean? Well, um, we'll talk about the additive doses when we get to the next theory. <clears throat> and then this is a, there's some disagreement on this one. Hormesis proposes that small doses of radiation are actually helpful for culling weak cells. That, that's, a, that's a big debate in terms of radioactivity. The top two items, that doses below the threshold can be handled by the body, and that doses are not additive is not controversial. Hormesis is controversial. You have people that, that will be on either side of that um, debate. Then there's the linear no threshold theory. This is a strange theory. This says that all doses are detrimental no matter how small. So this is strongly against hormesis that says small doses are, are helpful for culling weak cells. And then this one is very controversial, that doses are additive. So what does that mean? If you have a, a little bit of a dose today, a little bit of a dose tomorrow, the next day, you know, we, we work under that administrative limit to make sure we're under any, any uh, large dose, but this is tracking all the small doses that we have. And so if you say that the 500 REM is the LD50, and you've been working with radioactivity for 20 years, you've probably, over your job time, gone over, if you've gone over 500 REM, that you have a 50% chance of dying just by working for 20 years in the nuclear industry. So all of those small doses have added up over your life, and you have an expectation, you know, a, a dramatic, um, uh, dramatically lower expectation of life. <clears throat> this played a huge political role in 1959 to enact the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty. So they, they showed that, well, these doses are small because of this radiation in the upper atmosphere. And so they said, yeah, but all doses are detrimental and they're additive. So this, is, uh, this is, uh, was a scare tactic that was successful. And so then the Soviet Union and the United States both agreed, based on this, this theory, that uh, they would enact an atmospheric test ban. So they would no longer test nuclear weapons in the open atmosphere. They would do them underground where everything was contained. And so, the, in my opinion, this is my opinion now, it's just continued to this day and that's a, sad, that's a sad thing because this is a very strange toxicological theory on the right. We don't use this theory for any, anything else. Okay, that, that um, if you look at uh, some of these examples, you know, you've breathed automobile exhaust and the linear no threshold theory says that someday you're going to pass out due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Like one day you're going to hit that threshold where you just plots because you got enough CO in your body. But you know that the body will pass CO. I mean, it'll eventually come off of the iron or those cells that have been damaged by the CO will die, be processed by the liver, out they go you'll produce more blood cells that can carry oxygen. And so your body can handle small doses and eliminate those. Uh, same thing with water. If you've ever got water in your lungs, one of these days you're going to do it and that's going to be the, the last time. I mean, you're going to drown, you know. <laughs> Swallow wrong, <laughs> you know. In small amounts over long periods of time accumulate in the body and then boom. We don't use that kind of linear no threshold theory for any other kind of insult to our body. Um, so the toxin is the dose. This is sort of a generic uh, toxicology. We have normal environmental input. I just thought this slide was funny. That's why I picked it. So then <laughs> absorption, the toxins come in and they go into the body and uh, they're distributed and metabolized in the body and then eliminated out the drain. Okay. And so ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So things go through our body. Some things do bioaccumulate. Okay. And so here's the biological half-lives for a lot of toxins. And the, the longest one on this list is cadmium. 
And so one of the most toxic substances that we have in terms of bioaccumulation, they're actually the most poisonous metal is thallium. Um, <clears throat> I was asking the infrared guy that was working on my um, infrared spectrometer, my windows are all made of potassium bromide, and potassium bromide will, um, will absorb around 500 wave numbers. But if you look at the little sheet that says, here's all the window materials you can use for infrared, they, I, they have uh, cesium iodide, which you know, absorbs, uh, is, is clear down to like 200 wave numbers, and then thallium bromide is even better. Okay, and I said, why don't they make windows out of thallium bromide? And the guy said, probably because just by touching them, you'd die. I said, excuse me? No. And he said, thallium is soluble enough in sweat that if you touch the thallium bromide window, you'd get a lethal dose of thallium. <laughs> so that's why they don't make that in oh, my window. <laughs> yeah, but this is showing you that some things are bioaccumulated, okay? But radiation is not on this list. Not that this is an exhaustive list, but you would find, you know, if you were to look at the biological half-life for radiation, what would you track? Radiation ionizes water, damages cells, and those cells are metabolized by the body. So there's no physiological way to accumulate radiation. Yeah. So even, even a mode of action, there'd be no way to support the linear no threshold theory. Um, this is just, again, we've uh, looked at normal toxicology. You have the LD50. If this is the physiological effect is death, then up here, uh, you know, this dose would be expected death. LD50 is 50% of the population dies. Uh, normal toxicological treatment would have these lower levels, lowest observed level, which would be 25 rem, and below 25 rem, you don't have any adverse effects that are observed. So, uh, but you think, well, maybe you have hypersensitivity. And so short exposure time to some toxins may create hypersensitivity. And we're familiar with this, peanut allergies, latex allergies, isocyanates, and so on. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes you can accumulate those uh, and cause hypersensitivity sensitivity effects. So I've thought about, you know, this would work with, with these long-term biological materials like lead and cadmium and PCBs, but there's, again, nothing to accumulate in terms of cell damage. Um, uh, you do have, you probably have already had cancer in your life and your body has eradicated it. So your body will respond to non-native cells and a cancer cell that divides rapidly may produce abnormal proteins on the, on the outer membrane, and your body sees that as foreign and will kill it. So you, most people have some reaction to cancerous cells. If they miss a few and then it doubles faster, then the body can't keep up, and then you have a, you have a tumor. Okay. And if you have no response to cancerous cells, then you probably already have had cancer. Like you get it young because you don't have any response. So. Now, lung cancers, up to 14% of lung cancers come from radon, and so you have uranium in the soil in certain, you know, regions, Montana, Philadelphia, uh, you know, Pennsylvania, there's some in New Mexico, and, and so the uranium in the rock formations will decay, and when it gets to radon, it's really quite amazing. You know, all of these are chemically active, but here we have a noble gas. So if you think about the covalent bonds that are formed with radium, and all of a sudden the nucleus changes and now you have an even number of, or you have a, a sort of a noble gas number of protons and the electrons correspond to that and all those covalent bonds are broken. And so now you have a free gas percolating through the rock. And although it has a very short half-life, uh, it's, there's statistically a chance that that one radon atom will not decay for quite a long time and make its way all the way up into your basement. You're down there doing the laundry in Pennsylvania, breathing in the radon, and it uh, can cause up to, like they said, 14% of lung cancer deaths. After the early 80s, when we made our homes energy efficient, it sealed up the doors and windows, the cancers rose, and they traced it to radon gas. Uh, we've talked about the, the different half-lives. Radon is 3.82 days which is, just seems amazing to me. If you think of how long it would take for gas to diffuse through rock and soil and then make it in through concrete into a basement and then accumulate, and then the bad luck of that person. Here's a nucleus who, against all odds, still hasn't decayed. Right. 
So the distribution is quite wide. You've got, a, you've got an average distribution that says the half-life is 3.82 days, but some of those atoms will go for years and years and years. So that's really bad luck. This atom is way beyond its average decay rate, and it gets in your lung, and then it decays. And then you get all these other elements in your lungs. You know, polonium, bismuth, lead, polonium, bismuth, lead, and then lead. So, and then all of these, these three alpha particles and these uh, four beta particles, actually uh, four of each, four alpha particles and four beta particles are being blasted around in your lungs, creating damage. But then there's good uses for the radioisotopes. So we have iodine and iron and phosphorus and technetium and thallium and sodium. Um, thallium. I don't know, but uh, most the, the biggest one is this technetium-99 uh, for uh, studying the flow in the heart. And then we have positron emitters, so carbon-11. I show this because it's fantastic. This is what we call a zero background technique. So you can tell the computer to look at these different detectors, and that's what this ring is around this uh, woman's head. These are gamma ray detectors, and you can tell the computer if you get a signal on detector one, go look over here at detector 200, and if there wasn't a simultaneous signal on any of those other detectors, then throw that count away. So there's a discriminator. So you have background radiation, like we measured in the lab, 13 counts per minute on every one of these detectors. And so they've got a fair amount of noise, but the computer can say, was there a simultaneous count on the other side? Because we're dealing with the speed of light. After this annihilation, those two gamma rays come out, go through the head and into the detectors, and so the computer's looking for simultaneous signals. So these two pop, okay, keep that number. So if this, if this positron is emitted, annihilates with an electron, gives off two gamma rays, we get a simultaneous signal here and there, and the computer says, okay, there was a positron emission somewhere on this line. So it just has a line through their head. And then you get another signal here, and now it's on that line. Where do those lines intersect? And so it can just look at the intersections of these lines and map out uh, what's going on in terms of the signal. Now, how does that relate to tumors? Well, think about carbon. Carbon, you know, you put that in sugar. You take carbon-11, make sugar with carbon-11, put that in the body. Glucose, where's that going to go? It's going to go where the cells are using the most energy. And cancer cells are using a lot of energy doing division. And so you find the, the energy-hungry cells in the brain, and you're going to get a map of the tumor, a really high-resolution map. Now we get into nuclear fuel, and there's a whole section on, on this, the next set of notes. And so we'll just skip ahead to that. But here's a, a, a research reactor to, to make uh, medical isotopes. And you can see that, you know, whereas the power reactors are inside these huge buildings and, you know, there's nobody inside, so highly radioactive. They run these research reactors at low power and they have all kinds of little pathways, uh, kind of like the bank teller where you put the money in the, in the little pneumatic tube and it flows through the ceiling and over into the teller's window and then they do the, uh, the interactions that come back. They do the same thing with the nuclear uh, core down here. So these guys can put their samples and run them down there with compressed air, and you have the sample down in the nuclear core for however long you want to expose it to the neutrons or gamma rays or whatever you want to experiment with, and then you suck it back up, and then you've got your sample. So it's really cool. You don't actually have to go down there. You can just send it with pneumatic uh, pressure and, and deposit it. We call them rabbits. You put the rabbit in the little, little tube, and there it goes, and then it comes back. We had one of those in Oregon. We had a research reactor where, as a freshman, we got to, um, I was a TA, so I took my students over to the nuclear chemistry lab, and I was super excited about it. We had aluminum foil in this little Teflon rabbit, and we put it in the wall, closed the deal, hit go, went down into the reactor for a few minutes, and then came back, and then we measured the counts. We activated the aluminum, and it started turning into silica. So, yeah, it was really fun. And so that's, uh, this, this reactor that I showed is actually for producing molybdenum-99. And you can read the article uh, on it. I'll put these notes up there. But this Molly-99 is uh, made in commercial nuclear reactors. 
So neutrons bombard the uranium-235 target, and then that produces about 6% of moly-99, molybdenum-99. So they extract that, and they make these little um, technetium generators. So there's, uh, they've got some little chemistry set that will allow them to separate the technetium from the other products, and then make a formulation, and then inject it into your bloodstream to track your, um, the flow in your coronary arteries. So they actually ship the Molly 99 because the technetium has about a six hour half-life. And so they've got to make it on site. So they get they send it to these formularies that make this, this uh, formulation for heart stress tests. And, and I would love to know more about that. I just read this one article. It's pretty amazing. So now let's talk about power. Since we're in the energy section of the notes, we're now to, the, to nuclear power. And when I started looking into this, it answered one of the biggest questions I always had related to nuclear energy. How is it that you can split an atom and get energy, but then you can fuse two nuclei and get energy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's weird. If, if splitting an atom gives you energy, how does fusing an atom give you energy? It can't be a linear curve, right? It, there's got to be some other business going on. And, and here is the chart. This is the nuclear stability. And this tells you how you can measure the age of a star by the metal content in the star. And iron will build up and that star will get more and more dense. You can sort of measure the age of a star by the iron emission in that star. Because iron is it's pretty flat, but iron is one of the most stable nuclei. Yeah, so if you're beyond iron, so again, this is the most stable. If you're beyond iron, like uranium-235, breaking that nucleus apart will make the nucleus more stable. It'll get closer to iron. And so you're going to get energy back. As you're making more stable nucleus, it's lower in energy, you get energy out of the system. And then fusing light elements to make heavier elements below iron, you're getting closer to iron, then you're getting more and more stable. And the biggest jump is going from hydrogen to helium. So down here is hydrogen, up here is helium. So if you can take hydrogen or deuterium, heavy hydrogen, and fuse that to make helium, you get more, look how much more energy you get per nucleus than you get from uranium all the way down to lead. And so if, if fission is, you know, is this powerful, look how much more powerful fusion is. It's amazing how much more energy you get from fusing atoms than you get from breaking them apart. Yeah. And so that's why you went from like a 20 kiloton range for the Hiroshima device, the, the fission bomb, to, to thermonuclear getting up into megatons. So you're getting a thousand times more power out of a hydrogen bomb than you ever got out of a uranium bomb. Okay. And so that's just, and it's not that much more weight. Okay, you're adding a little bit of hydrogen into the mix and you're just a time factor of a thousand in terms of the amount of energy given off. So this is what's going on in nuclear reactions. This reaction is stored in the, in the stability of the nucleus. It's the strong nuclear force. So what's holding those protons together is this strong nuclear force. It's related to the ratio of the neutrons to the protons. If you were to treat the nucleus as a cluster of grapes, which is what I was telling you, probably not the best analogy, but we still mentally want to count the neutrons and count the protons, and we, we do that in terms of our reactions. But if you take the neutron mass out of the CRC and the proton mass out of the CRC and you add them up, you will not get the right mass for the nucleus. Everybody catch that? So carbon-12, six neutrons, six protons. We take the neutrons, add up those six masses, Six proton masses, it's not 12. Transpromole, there's some missing mass. It's called a mass defect. And that difference in mass times the speed of light squared tells you the binding energy of the nucleus. Einstein's equation equals mc squared. So you actually get to use that equation. <laughs> okay, here we have uh, deuterium making helium, gives off some gamma rays. But you take the mass of the products and subtract the mass of the reactants and you get this mass defect. So this is the, from the CRC, the isotopic mass for helium. This is the isotopic mass for deuterium. There's two of those. 
and you get this change in 0 0.024 grams per mole. Multiply that by the speed of light squared, and you get 10 to the 12 joules per mole. 10 to the 12 joules per mole of deuterium fused. That's crazy. A mole of deuterium is two grams, and you can get 10 to the 12 joules out of that. If you're able to fuse two grams of deuterium, you could get 10 to the 12th joules. It's crazy. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And when they were doing the numbers, they realized immediately there's a lot of power in the nucleus. And this was in the, right at the end of the, um, the 19th century. So 1890s, they were realizing we have a whole new power system at, at our fingertips. And so then nuclear bombs and nuclear energy both come from this. So a ton of TNT releases 4 billion joules. That's a chemical explosion, explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, a, how much would equal a ton? So 4 gigajoules per ton of TNT or 85 gigajoules per gram of uranium. Gram. Okay. So 1 gram of uranium would be about 21 tons of TNT if you completely converted that whole gram of uranium. Yeah, you couldn't, you could probably, that would probably fill this room. We'll see an example of that. So this is 100 tons of TNT. This was the test at the Trinity site to de test their detectors. So they have pressure detectors and cameras and everything, and so they needed a big explosion to test all the, all the detectors. And they weren't going to take their one nuclear weapon and blow it up and say, oh, the recordings didn't capture anything. You know, so they had a 100-ton test. And this is a picture of the 100-ton test. Now, all that wood up there is C4 explosives, all or composition B. It's all packed in closely. It's 100 tons of it on this scaffold. And there's people there. There's 13 men standing across. So to take the photograph on 100 tons is 13 people wide. Okay, And this was... 20,000 tons of TNT, and there's Bradbury, Ray Bradbury, standing next to it. <laughs> the big difference in amount of energy and the size of the package that it fits in. 100 tons of TNT, 20,000 tons of TNT, 200 times more powerful standing right next to a guy. And so that's, that's pretty incredible. You could, can't put that on a plane. Remember, this was all during wartime. You can put this on a plane. Okay. And so this is our 2000 and tw millennial problem. You know, this was done with a Ryder truck full of ammonium nitrate fuel oil. It brought down most of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Okay, now there's a chair here. I use that for scale. So that chair, if you think about on the screen, that's about the size of a person sitting down. Okay, and this was a Ryder truck full of about six or eight drums of ammonium nitrate fuel oil with an explosive on top to detonate it. So it's about a, you know, a, a truck-sized bomb could do this to a building with conventional explosives. So you take that same chair and put it right there by the railing. So we've got about the same scale in terms of the, vid the picture on the screen. <clears throat> and this is the sedan crater. That's the opposite wall of the crater. And this was buried underground, you know, a moderate amount. Um, and it just made a crater. If you were to look at this from, from Google Maps or Google Earth, uh, which you can see on Google Maps, if you go to Nevada, type in Sedan Crater, not Sudan with a U, but S-E-D-A-N, Sedan Crater. You'll, you'll look at that. If you can tell how high you're off, you know, on Google Earth, you could tell what your altitude was. And so I, I sort of drew a circle on the screen at, at, at a certain altitude, and then I went to Oklahoma City and found the federal building at the same altitude, this was a five by five block region. That would be the, that would be the crater. Okay. So, th and so that's my point is, that would also fit in the same truck. So we have a problem in terms of nuclear proliferation. If, if we have uh, terrorists with nuclear devices, you know, they can do this to Oklahoma City and not just that. So we've got a real, real issue with nuclear proliferation. Uh, 200,000 tons TNT equivalent. This was done underwater, 90 feet underwater. Um, 
Yeah, crossroads test. It, it uh, took out a whole fleet of ships. They, now there were test ships. It was after World War II, so they had a lot of ships that were just sort of barely maintained to, mm -hmm. to push supplies around the globe and so on. So they didn't need these ships. And they said, what would a nuclear device underwater do to an armada of ships? So they set these ships up in a formation and they blew this device up and it wrecked uh, the whole fleet. So this, is a, this is a trainer, but this is just to show you the scale of, of, of a device. Um, so yeah, this is a modern day system. That's me. Didn't recognize me because I had hair back then. Okay. This is one of my students from uh, the previous university, West Texas A&M. He was a chemistry student, also worked out there at Pentex. And so uh, we did research on cleaning. You know, I still do research on cleaning. This was the beginnings of it all. And so they said, clean it. And so he's got a little wipe on there. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't clean the outsides of these things. <laughs> okay. We cleaned certain components on the inside. So let's talk about what's going on to release this kind of energy. A neutron, like in this case, hits a uranium-235, uh, it can split apart a bunch of different pathways. This just shows three of them, uh, two of the pathways, like tellurium and zirconium plus two neutrons, or barium and krypton plus three neutrons. The point is you get more neutrons than you put in. That's the key. Many, many transmutations would just continue to give you one neutron out. Leo Zilar was probably You've probably never heard of his name, but he was one of the scientists that said if we could ever find a nuclear reaction that would give a doubling of neutrons, one in and two out, then we could have a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. And he said that um, he's the one that alerted uh, uh, the president. Essentially, he, he, con he convinced Einstein to write a letter to President Roosevelt to say, we've got to do research on this because, again, during the war, they were worried about the other side getting access to nuclear weapons and, and everybody had a bomb program at the time because of the enormous amount of energy. So this is what's going on. Neutron comes in, it's more like a water drop, so the water drop thins out in the middle and splits apart and gives you three neutrons and a couple of large nuclei. Um, you can see this type of behavior in a lava lamp. One time we were walking through a junk shop. And my wife and I, I got mesmerized by this lava lamp. Have you seen a lava lamp? I've got one upstairs. I should bring it down and heat it up. But if it spreads apart and then the meniscus snaps, sometimes you'll see little bitty drops in between. And those little bitty drops in that necked out region are these neutrons. Or at least it's a mental picture of the neutrons, how the nucleus spreads apart and snaps, and then you've got some particles in between the two major particles. So I'm sitting there watching this, and I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> nuclear power, or neutrons, or I see the neutrons or something. I forget exactly what I said. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know this guy. And it was pretty, pretty funny. So I saw about the lava lamp. So let's look at uh, a video of this. You may have seen this before on YouTube, but if you haven't, it's pretty exciting. And this is academic fair use. I'm commenting on this video. <laughs> so this is a high school in Cleveland several years back. So they did this with Skittles stop action. Um, I don't like the analogy because, again, it's like grapes or Skittles. Uh, but still, if that was like a water drop splitting apart some in the neck region, you'd have some neutrons come out. This is a perfect situation where you have zero neutron loss, which is never the case, okay? Like yeah, I know. <laughs> it's going to happen. See, a couple of them popped every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> and now, guys, teachers would be afraid the kids would sue, you know. I popped my finger. Okay, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to scoot ahead a little bit. 
but I don't know how far to go ahead. Anyway. Interesting thing. Look how they're putting the partitions by pronounced Travis. The analogy really holds well. That is a, a barrier to keep the neutrons inside to make it a critical mass. So if you lose more neutrons, then, uh, then you know, well, yeah. So look at the role the ceiling plays and the walls play. Okay, controlling the neutrons is how you control the chemical, the, the nuclear reaction. And so if you take those walls away and you lose neutrons, or if you have a neutron absorbing material on those walls, that's what the control rod does, is that it sucks up the neutrons and slows or cools the reaction. If you pull those control rods out, or in this case, put the walls back, then you, you control the neutrons. Now here's a video. So that, notice it took a while even with the, with the, um, with the mouse traps for the, all of them to to slow down, I mean, or to to uh, get tri tripped, but with no neutron loss, then you have a bomb situation. So that was a nuclear power reactor. This would be a nuclear bomb. So notice the tight box controls all of the neutrons and keeps them in place. So this would be no neutron loss at all in a tight space. And look how fast it goes. This is slow mo. And then it just sweeps. You see that? The first, there was like doubling, another doubling, and then it just runs through the material. And, and that's, that's tight control of neutrons. And that's a, a really um, dramatic example of enormous energy release. And so this, again, this controlling the, uh, the neutrons is where the term critical mass comes from. Because if you just think about a mass of uranium, let's take the simplest uh, example of a sphere. Uh, if the sphere is too small, the neutrons go in a straight line. They're not affected by charge because they're not charged. And so if you have a small mass, they're, and I'm in the very center and a nucleus spits me out and I've got a direct path, if it's a small mass, mass, I can see daylight, right? I can go through all the nuclei and escape the mass. Uh, but if it's big enough I, and I'm inside, I can't see daylight. I'm going to hit a nucleus before I escape. And so that's when you, when you get to a big enough mass, the probability of the neutron escaping drops and it hitting another nucleus goes up. And so there's a certain threshold size of the object above which you have a critical mass and you can sustain a chain reaction, below which you can't. And so what we do is we have, uh, in a nuclear power reactor, we have a lot of subcritical masses. We don't want to have a critical mass. We want to be able to control the criticality. And so you have half a critical mass here and half a critical mass there with a control rod in between. You pull that control rod out, now they can see each other and you have a critical mass. Put the control rod out in and it cools down. And so we have a lot of subcritical masses in a, in a reactor and you can control the criticality by using the control rods. So this is how a nuclear power plant is, is arranged. We have a containment vessel concrete and steel. We have the nuclear um, core here with the control rod mechanism held from the top. Most of the time these are gravity fed, so there's a fail safe. If something happens, then the control rods fall in through gravity because you're not going to stop gravity. If you stop gravity, we've got bigger problems than <laughs> a nuclear meltdown. <laughs> so. So uh, the control rods drop in and, and again, make the thing subcritical. It takes hours for it to cool down to below boiling water, but, but, uh, but that would be the, sort of the shut-in temperature. And then in, in modern nuclear reactors, we have a, we have a controlled, um, contained loop where the radioactive water that's in contact with the core is all inside this containment. 
And so then we have a secondary loop that is the steam generator loop. So notice how the, the radioactive water and the pipes in contact with that radioactive water are all inside the containment. The secondary loop is what we use to generate electricity. And then the tertiary loop takes away the waste heat. And so when you have a, a reservoir or a river that's helping cool a nuclear power plant, that's not in contact with the core. Mm -hmm. So they're not taking lake water and running it through the, the core and then dumping it out into the lake. So you don't have to worry about them. The fish aren't flowing. You know, it's a nice joke, but it's, it's, it's two loops away from the core. Okay, and this is a picture of the concrete and you know, the construction of a power plant. So inside, you've got the fuel rods, subcritical masses. When you pull the control rods out, then you have a, a critical arrangement. And, and this is the Fukushima reactor, which we talked about. There was a video uh, that I posted with the notes so I posted the video from the lecture where we talked about the Fukushima disaster, and it was a really great analysis. And they actually did melt down. I didn't know this, but this video gave me more information. So yeah, the, 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 molten, the fuel elements did melt. They did, uh, in a couple of cases, burn through this stainless steel containment, and they're down in the bottom of this concrete vessel. Yeah, and so they're sending in, you know, robotic cameras and stuff to monitor. It's, it's called corium because <laughs> it's got all kinds of uh, elements from the reactor core. Okay? Uh, only in one case is this, this uh, containment steam loop uh, busted and some of those radioactive elements are leaking into the seawater. Yeah. And so they're trying to stabilize it and they're trying to monitor that plume. Now we've had groundwater and seawater contaminated uh, by other elements and so we have a lot of times what we call pump and treat uh, um, setups where you pump the, the contaminated water, treat it, and release it. So you, you set up this elaborate system where you pump and treat the contaminated water. So they're probably going to set up a, a pump and treat system with this uh, nuclear contamination from this containment vessel. The core, as far as I could tell, the core is not in contact <coughs> with the groundwater or the ocean. It was some of the gaseous radioactive elements that were trapped in this suppression pool that is cracked and leaking. Now, a success story would be the U.S. Nuclear Navy and many other nuclear navies around the world, but ours is um, the one I have the statistics on. And so we've developed over 27 different power plants. So different power plants for nuclear submarines, for carriers, for merchant ships, I mean uh, supply ships, and put them in uh, 210 nuclear-powered ships, taken 5,000 cores. So these are different, these are different designs, power plant designs. And then each design has multiple cores. So we've taken over 500 reactors into operation and uh, accumulated over 5,400 years of operation experience. So those 500 cores being operated for several years have added up to well over 5,000 years of experience with nuclear power. And then gone over 128 million miles and counting. So, uh, and these are amazing systems. So the, the nuclear power plant drives the generators, which drive the ship, but they also produce fresh water. So they use that electricity to um, desalinate water and produce fresh water on the ship. So you, you may run out of food, but you're not going to run out of water, <laughs> okay? which is a good thing. Okay? A friend of mine was in the, uh, the uh, submarine force, and he said when they went out on deployment, the food, they walked on the food for several months. Like they had stocked up with so much food, they were walking on top of canned goods and so on. And then as they, you know, steamed and they would start using that food, food was their only resource that they had to go in. If they didn't have to have food, they could stay under water forever. I mean, for the whole deployment. So it's pretty interesting. Now they, there's uh, energy is not isolated. It has resources in the environment. So we extract energy from our resources and, and then the resources are in the environment and the energy wastes and waste heat are also in contact with the environment. So there is zero, there's no such thing as zero impact or zero emissions, no matter what the technology. Okay, so this uh, set of notes, we can just go through quickly. We've talked about uh, fossil fuels, hydrogen, and our reserves earlier, but I wanted to cut to um, what we do with nuclear waste. So I know we're, we're out of time, but let me just do 
say two minutes on this. This definition of pollution is so useful. It's loss of control of a concentrated substance that causes harm. And harm may be subjective, and concentration may be subjective. Which one do you use? But control is not subjective. And solid waste is the best. Liquid waste moves. Gaseous waste is really hard to control. So if you can get solid waste and monitor it, that's the best way to go. Okay. And so then they take the radionuclides that have long half-lives and they'll mix them in with glass and they'll pour them into these billets called vitrified waste. And glass is fantastic. I mean, it's basically molten sand, you know, and you make it solid again. And you can store that. And so one of the places for storage of this is in Yucca Mountain. And you can do all kinds of research on that. Um, there's a, they're trying to, you know, for, probably 20 years have tried to open this nuclear waste disposal. Uh, there's a lot of ar arguments against it, but Yucca Mountain would be a nice controlled way to store our waste. Um, this is what's already there in Nevada, the unencapsulated residue of 828 nuclear detonations. Yucca Mountain is not going to add anything to that. Yucca Mountain will be controlled and monitored. These things are uncontrolled. They are monitored, but they're uncontrolled. These are in the ground. These are little, it looks like a golf ball, little divots in the ground. And you can go to Google Earth and like, zoom in on the Nevada test site, and you can see all of the, you can count them up, all the little nuclear detonations. And so it's, um, it's a problem you guys and your generation is going to have to deal with. So it's best to know about it.